Hi, you're listening to Sam Horn Live Podcast. I'm Sam Horn, and welcome to the show. the man that's sam horn on the inaugural edition of the sam horn live podcast what's up sam hey what's up louis how you doing bro good, good. i'm luis vasquez co-host of the sam horn live podcast man what a pleasure people have been dying to hear from you every project you're involved with and, and we all are pretty aware you do a lot right now we'll get into a lot of that over the course of all the episodes mr sam horn former major league baseball player entrepreneur and now TV personality, which is something you've done before. Uh-huh. <laughs> I think we're all pretty aware of that. And, and we'll get into his new show. We'll talk baseball. We'll talk stories. And we'll keep it real. Always. Everything is on the table right here on the Sam Horn Live podcast. How you feeling, Sam? Oh, I'm feeling real good right now. I'm happy to be here. Uh, thanks for bringing me out of the closet. Uh, like you <laughs> said, there's a lot of things that I've been wanting to talk about, but I kind of kept them in. But it's time to come out. That's How right. y'all doing out there? Especially over this beat. Oh, you like that, huh? I, I get like goosebumps that. just thinking about, hey, how long <laughs> it's been for me really getting back in the swing of things. That's right. That's right. And you're fresh off inking a new deal with Comcast Sportsnet here in Boston and New England. Yes. Which will bring us how many new shows of what is your pregame? Six. Six total. I call it the six pack. But we, <laughs> you know, we already got one of them out there. So it's a total of seven shows. We want to say thank you to... Uh, Comcast uh, New England. Um, we really uh, look forward to hopefully uh, getting deeper into some of the people in the community and uh, bringing you guys a little different flavor. So, Sam, let's kick it off with this. A lot of people, when I tell them personally, when I say, yeah, my guy Sam Horn is doing this, my business partner Sam Horn is doing that, my friend Sam Horn is doing this, they want to know about your time with two people specifically. Okay, and this is this is mostly baseball heads. Your time with Cal Ripken Jr., any interactions you had there, and Ted Williams, which is just just crazy to think about, you know, being in Major League Baseball and interacting with guys like that. A lot of the questions I get is, can you ask him about that? Does he have any stories? Do you? Here we are, Sam Horn Live. Well, I have to say uh, those are two great people that uh, I was I was fortunate to be around while I was playing and uh I think I'll start with Ted Williams because for me, Ted Williams was a guy who believed uh, that all of the best hitters came from San Diego and everyone knew that and he used to talk about that and when I was drafted, he said, hey, you know what I said? I I was like, what do you mean? He goes, all of the best hitters come from San Diego. So from that point on, in my mind, when I started my career, I wanted to be on Ted Williams' team because he treated me nice. He was such a legend. Um, Everyone was like saying, hey, he's taking a special liking to you. Why? And the reason was is because he just seen that I had uh, tremendous power and I was hitting a lot of line drives. And he said that, hey, I could help you, son. He goes, why don't you come over to the, the little field? I have a really nice picture that I'll share with some, some people on my website. Uh, but Ted Williams came uh, to a batting practice a little bit early just for me for about two weeks in a row. And all he told me to do was start to put some lift on your swing. He said, don't change your whole swing. Don't change your approach. He said, just put some lift on it where other people in the organization was telling me to swing up. He just said, put lift at the end of your swing because you were getting to the ball, you were hitting the ball with tremendous power. So for him to to take a special liking to me, I really tried hard, and my effort from that point just escalated. And I, I really tried harder to do what he wanted me to do. And eventually, once I caught that that trajectory that he was looking for then I started hitting a lot of home runs so that's my story with Ted Williams a really nice guy he had a a great liking for people from San Diego so him and I got along very well so working with him one-on-one what was that like was he hard on you was he easy to work with was he a chill guy well he he put his hands in his back pockets uh he had a a fungal that he he put between his arms and like I said put his hands in his back pocket and when I was doing well, you, you would just see him kind of nod a little bit. But then when I, uh, I was struggling with it and I was trying to take it into the game, 
he he saw that I was thinking too much. Mm. And when I came over to talk to him, he he never raised his voice. He was always a happy man, but he it looked like he was always thinking. And every time I looked at him, that's that's the vision that I remember that he was always thinking. And that was because he was trying to help me uh, and and let me see his vision for me. And once I got it, like I said, once I was able to put the trajectory that he was looking for on a pitch, I just remember him looking over at me and all he did was have a nice little grin on his face and he bobbed his head a little bit as to say, hey, now you got it. That almost sounds father and son right there. And, and it was. It was just like that. Ted w- Williams, for me, was just a, a really nice guy who who saw someone in me that was really trying to adapt to his type of swing, a swing that would get the ball in the air because I had a lot of power. And he told me, hey, if nothing else, you have the tools to do it. Just continue to work hard. And sooner or later, the focus would come in. Do you remember the last time you saw him? Uh, I would think um, when they when he was on the cart for the All Star Game when the All Star Game was at Fenway Park. What a moment! Yes, what a moment! And because you know, yeah. at that time I was able to to be around and, and you know be at Fenway Park and just be able to say hey and touch him a little bit right. made me feel good, you know. And and you know, of course, he's not with us now, but I, I think about Ted all the time because. Uh, like I said, I have this portrait of him and I in my house, so I see him almost every day. I mean, that going back to that moment was in a, like such an electric night in baseball, not just Red Sox history, but in all of baseball. Did you witness the actual pregame ceremony they had for him? Were you there on the field in person? Well, I wasn't on the field, but of yeah. course I was very you close. Were there. I, I right. was at the the ballpark, and that's why I was saying when he came off and everything. I you, was so you saw to, him after, yes. after the fact. Yes. Yeah, so how I was he a, feeling? What was that like? Well, you, How could, you, could, you could tell there was a glow on his face. Right. You know, um, there was a lot of stars at Fenway Park. It was and, crazy. And I would say amongst them all, he was probably the, the brightest star that shined that night. Right. So for me, just to to know that I personally had a chance to, to talk to him and just say, hey, you know, thanks for what you did for me, uh, that will go a long ways in my memory. So moving on to your Orioles days now. Yes. You got to play with another great alongside Cal Ripken Jr. What was that like, and do you have any cool, funny, crazy, sad stories, recollections well, <laughs> in your back pocket about I, Cal? I have, I have a what was couple. your relationship like with him? Well, I, I want to start with the one that was uh, probably uh, was known uh, a little less than Cal, and that was his dad. And Cal Ripken's father, when we moved into the new stadium, there was three lockers, and he took one on the far right. He who? And, he meaning Cal Ripken Sr. Sr., okay. And he was known as a hard guy, and nobody really wanted to, like, go over by him because he was a toughie, you know. And I remember, <laughs> I don't know why I did, but I went over, I think, just to mess with him and ask him if I could sit on the far left uh, locker kind of by his because he had his locker also in the coach's room, but he had one outside because we had such a big clubhouse. He had, like you know, multiple lockers. Uh, But I got a chance to sit next to him all year in 1992. Uh, He um, used to grow tomatoes and peppers and all of this. And I remember every day he would bring in like a couple of tomatoes. And I used to have the tomato with the jalapeno peppers Three or four slices straight of bread up. Straight up. and some mayonnaise. And that was it because the <laughs> tomatoes were like steak, steak tomatoes, the okay. beefy yeah. ones. Yeah, right, right. Those ones. good ones right it there. It was just like yeah. meat. Mm-hmm. So every day he would bring them in, and, and it just became a thing. And I remember Cal saying, hey, my dad brings them over to you before he brings them over to my house. <laughs> Get out. So, you know, I felt <laughs> okay. special. Absolutely. But Cal Ripken uh, Jr. and I, and I'll even say Brady Anderson. It's my dude we, right there. The yes, sideburns. <laughs> well, we had a ritual where every day before batting practice at home, not on the road, but at home, we would wrestle. Wrestle. Yeah, you know, like. Like pro wrestling? Yeah, except for I was the man. I was a champ. So, <laughs> you know, we had to take it easy. But every now and then I would get Cal. And who would jump in but that Brady Anderson? And so throughout the whole season, 
I always used to, you know, go back and forth trying to, you know, get these guys when they least expected it because both of them together, I was no match, but I could get them one on one. So Wait, hold on. So let me get this straight. You, Brady Anderson, and Kyle Ripken Jr. Every, used to all every be day pro before, wrestlers before batting practice. Every day when we were going out to stretch, I, I would have to watch out for them or they would have to watch out for So they me. would do this on the field. Every day before we started stretching, everybody knew something was getting ready to happen. So it was like, <laughs> okay, let's go ahead on and get it started. So conditioning coaches always had an extra eye on you guys. Yes, but it was like easy, <laughs> easy going because, you know, right. uh, one guy told me, he goes, Sam, do you know if you hurt Cal Ripken, you will like be out of baseball right. forever? Right. And I never even thought about you're, it. You're like playing that. with someone's money, putting your hands well, on that. I was playing man. with fire, but either way, <laughs> either way, that was the kind of camaraderie we had uh, back then. And for me, Cal Ripken was probably uh, my favorite uh, player to play with because uh, in today's world, you always see um, when teams are coming in to play, you you would say, "Here's Johnny's team or Bobby's team." Well, everywhere we went, it was Cal Ripken. And the Oreos. And, of course, he, he had put his time in. He was the man. But in saying that, when I first came over to the Oreos, and every person that came uh, on that team, Cal Ripken treated everyone the same. And it's really hard to say that because there's not many relationships where you can say, hey, I treat everyone the same. But this guy, he, he treated everybody nice. Uh, he would be the first one at the ballpark. He would be the last one to leave. Um, this guy played through multiple injuries. And through all of that, through the thick and the thin, he was the best teammate before he was the best player. So you mentioned the new ballpark, and you were part of that first team to be there and play there. What was that like to have the reunion recently? You recently attended that. The three pro wrestlers were back together any of that go down? And tell us a little bit about that experience and, and the reunion over at Camden Yards. Well, the reunion itself was great. Uh, as soon as I saw Cal and, of course, Brady and them and, and the rest of the teammates at that time, uh, of course, you know, it was just a big smile that came to everyone's face that we were back there again 25 years later. Uh, some people a big bag of snacks. Some people were looking – like they could still play. So I think they thought I was going to be one of the latter, you know, the big bag of snacks. They were like, Sam right. Horn, wait till you see him. I bet you he's going to be, you know, like out of shape and adi, 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 because when they called me to do the home run hitting contest, you know, no one had seen me from from the Oreos in a while. So they knew, they knew back in the days I loved to eat. Right, right, right. You're the love, big guy. You got to maintain. Snacks. Right. You got to maintain. You got to hit those bombs, man. So, so, you know, of course they knew that, you know, uh, I was that person that didn't shy away from the kitchen. So they thought that maybe he would have let himself go, which right, that right. was not the case. So to their surprise, uh, you know, we came in. Uh, there was, you know, uh, uh, a meet and greet with the, the media and all of the people who worked there and stuff like that. So it was just really a nice time to say hello and reminisce about my time playing there. Um, upon meeting Cal, uh, he used to say, hey, your hands are like pinchers because, of course, everyone knows they have the, the Maryland crabs and all of that from there. So uh, he used to call me pincher man. So he had this little thing where he had his little finger like this. And that was our handshake. Uh, so <laughs> it was just nice. As soon as I saw him, that was the first thing we did. He, he hit was you like, with oh. the pincher. He got the pincher on me. He goes, hey, what's <laughs> up, man? So we, we had a really good hug. And, and like I said, it was just like uh, old days. Everybody was, you know, really nice, a nice family uh, atmosphere. So uh, people can follow you on Twitter at Real Sam Horn. And a lot of the activity I saw around your Twitter were people saying, wow, he still looks the same. Sign him up. He still looks at him. That's a testament ah! to your regiment, obviously, of how you're taking care of yourself now. And, and we'll also get into how that has led to another project uh, that is becoming very well known now around Boston on television screens. What was it like to hit a couple more bombs at Camden Yards? Well, for me, I, I just wanted to show up. If, you know, if I didn't do anything, I wanted to hit one. And that was the big thing that I was thinking about. And I said, uh, 
uh, don't try to do too much because you can get hurt out here. And that's what people don't understand. You know, I hadn't picked up a bat in like maybe three years. And, you know, earlier I used to own a baseball school. Well, I was prepared because I was out there with the kids. I was showing them a lot of times how to get to certain pitches or I was just hitting off the machine. Well, I hadn't done none of that. Can we talk about how they put they shortened the distance for you guys? Uh, well, <laughs> for those guys. How did you feel when you saw that? Well, I wasn't happy because. They put a I, rope out in the outfield. Yeah, when they're talking about points, you know, I right. was like, hey, points. we should just go straight points right. over that fence. Right. Whoever right. hits the most over the fence, right. that's a major league man's home run. That's it. <laughs> well, either way, I lost, I lost uh, I'll say, uh, to Brady Anderson. Mm-hmm. 13 to 10. Who was around I, baseball bats and ability to, to hit whenever he wants, by the way. Well, so you did pretty well. I would say he was in much better shape than I was, <laughs> of course. And and Brady looks like he can still play. And I want to say yeah, for anyone that he does. Uh, has not seen Brady Anderson, when you see him, this guy, it's just like he's still in the GQ magazine. Right. You know, he he's, he's day. still ripped up. So. Yeah. You know, I was really happy for for you know uh, my performance against him because just to be in the same class with him at the end made me feel good. Also, right. So it came down to you guys, right? Yes. It was all fun and games, right? Or did it get a little competitive? Oh, it was definitely competitive, yeah. and I think yeah. <laughs> I think if I wouldn't have been tired because, like, I got fired up and I went inside and I hid in the in the cage, mm. and that's what they always tell you: don't leave it in the cage. But I wanted to see what I had, and and you know I wanted to kind of get some type of feel of you know what the aches and pains would be, so I would know not to go overboard. So uh, when I came out, it looked like we only had a couple of rounds of ten, but you know there was a few rounds in between just to get your stroke together. So I I, I really. <laughs> respect the guys again as I've always respect any athlete and and whatever sport they're in but baseball uh, you know just to hit that ball it still took a lot out of me so were you aiming for the building out in right field at Camden Yards or I was trying the to stands hit it. you just I was hit it as hard hit. as you could I was trying to hit what it was the through game the plan? Bi- I was trying to hit it through the building cuz I wanted to at least hit one through off the building. yeah <laughs> off of the building so everybody could go crazy However, just to hit it over the wall and hit one, you know, kind of deep, they they yeah. they applauded for me. So I was in heaven because for me, I knew that's what I was most known for, which was a person of prodigious home runs. So I wanted to hit at least one kind of deep, and I did. So the real question is, can you hit the red seat at Fenway Park? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say no because I remember when I first uh, – the first day I came to Fenway Park, and uh, I was I was a crusher back in the days, and I remember coming out and smashing balls everywhere, and I don't know where that red seat was, but it was in sight, and I can definitely tell you now it's not in sight anymore. There's no <laughs> one hitting that red seat up there, and you think of all of the, you know, massive home runs you've seen as far as distance uh, from any player you can name, you know. Those balls are way short of that red seat. So imagine if he, if and when he hit that seat, how far that ball really traveled. I mean, they say that David Ortiz always tried to hit it during batting practice, and he just came to the conclusion, it's like, no, I don't even know if that story is real anymore. BS. I don't know about the story, if it's real anymore, but I gave you my story. My story is I came out one day, it was in sight, and I can tell you right now, it is out of sight. <laughs> <laughs> Sam Horn. All right, so let's go back to the Twitter, as we promised before we jump into what is your pregame. There are a few questions here on the Twitter verse from users who want to ask you some questions. I'm looking through them now. We covered the Cal Ripken stories part from user at Rob underscore base 82. Thank you for that question. And then there is one here from at... Andriana, it appears, do you regret leaving any of the teams to go to another team? And then, as a second part, if you could nominate one player for the Hall of Fame, who would it be? Any regrets? There was uh, always a sense of when you you met certain families or people along the way um, and you maybe built relationships, of course, you kind of get sad when you have to move on. But 
this is a business and and when you start looking at it as it's not a business your feelings get hurt uh your mental get hurt uh, your heart gets heavy but if you keep it a business then it is easier to cope with and deal with and you know it's like if you look at sports nowadays, sometimes there's no commitments to a team. It's just commitment to the game. And that's okay because that's the business aspect of it. It's the guys who say, hey, you know, I'll take less money. I'll do this. I'll do whatever it takes so I can stay in Boston. That's someone who would regret being traded or sent away. And that's because they love the place they're in. As far as putting anyone in the Hall of Fame, I would still have to go with Cal Ripken. He would be my first choice because he's a person he, – he, he definitely was a great teammate. He was the epitome of a hard worker and, and putting his time in, and he was definitely a gentleman during uh, his time in and off the field. So at Roadrunner Dan 77 is asking, what is your favorite memory as an Orioles player? I would have to say meeting the Queen. Uh, I remember when Queen Elizabeth came to uh, to Memorial Park, and there was all of these things that they had sitting in our locker telling us what not to do. What there was nothing you could do. It was just what not to do. Don't reach out. Don't this. Don't like. Don't approach her because you might get shot. <laughs> you know what I mean? So um, So you had no choice. So all I recall <laughs> okay. is we no walked problem. by her, you kind of looked at her, you bowed with her with your head mm -hmm. and you moved on. No but wonder was, everyone everyone's so disciplined around her. Yes. <laughs> oh, you're going to get shot. Yeah, yes. But I recall how how you know all of her people came in ahead of time and told us what was going on and how it was just like uh, the president of the United States of right. course coming uh to the stadium so uh it was just the preparation uh the way the people were you know around her how nice they were but ultimately when she came out you couldn't approach her any kind of way so did you get a picture oh yeah i got that that's hanging Ooh. up and else too i got that <laughs> you got to get that up on your twitter i got to see that all right i can do that i can do that <laughs> all right moving on now to the next twitter question at Kimmet Maureen is asking, did you play AAA ball in Charlotte, North Carolina at some point in your career? I did. I played with the Charlotte Knights. I was the MVP. I hit 48 home runs. I hit 38 during the season, and then I hit 10 in the playoffs and, cha and the championship in order to be the MVP for uh, the championship that year. So played for the Charlotte Knights, and I had a blast. It was uh a good time. I had people like Manny, Manny on my team. Um, Going way back. Yes, Jim Tomey. Jim, oh, that was so. That imagine guy right it was there. yeah. Those so are imagine, two Indians legends. Yeah. Right so imagine uh, us hitting. It was Manny, Jim Tomey, and then myself. That was our three, four, five. That's pretty lethal, right there. That was pretty deep. They got to get you guys an MLB the show. Yeah. It's my game. So this is how it's going to work on the Sam Horn Live podcast. Out of those questions that you were just asked on Twitter, which one was your favorite? And the winner of Sam Horn's favorite question will get this autographed Major League Baseball that I'm holding right now. It's a real thing. And uh, we'll figure out the details how to get that to you. So Sam, go ahead. Which like question to, did you like? I like the one about uh, my moments at, uh, uh, with the uh, Oreos or whatever team I was with and how hard it would be to leave a team or what have you. Oh, okay, so that would be, do you ever regret leaving any of the teams? Yes. Do you like that question? Yes. So that was at Andriana with two N's. At Andriana, her name is here. It looks like her name is Ali. Get in touch. Uh, we'll, we'll figure out, we'll reach out to you uh, to send your address to the what is your pregame email, which we'll, we'll inform you with and we'll announce at the end of the show to claim your signed Sam Horn, Major League Baseball. So to end this podcast on a high note, and we don't have to rush through it necessarily, but we have to talk about the TV show that you just launched. We're now heading into episode three. You are super blessed to be at that point. That is amazing because I know personally that this started from the ground up from zero to 60, like you say. 
tell us a little bit about what inspired you to create this show. And obviously, we talked about the circle back around. You're in great shape. Everyone has seen that. You're hitting bombs still. <laughs> you look good, man. Sam Horn. What what kind of thought process went behind this? What inspired you to create this show and, and tell people a little bit about it? For me, uh, the name of the show is called What Is Your Pregame? And I wanted to do something that uh, everyone could relate to. Uh, I believe that every person has some type of pregame routine, ritual, thoughts, preparation, whether that's mental, physical, uh, however you want to get yourself together, whether that's some coffee, everyone thinks about uh, being prepared. For me, uh, the reason why I brought it up and how I thought about it is a lot of players, a lot of people are given opportunities and they're given talent. And a lot of people have to seriously work to get to the same place. So for me, I want to question you, and this is where it really came from. Would you rather have a person who has all of the talent or would you rather have the person who is the most prepared to get that task done? Option number two, because, all day. Because if you rely on talent only and your talent fails you that day, where do you go? However, if I'm prepared, I have multiple oppor opportunities to attack whatever my ultimate goal is, where I'm trying to get, because I'm prepared. I was prepared in case one, two, or three didn't work. I still have number four. Whereas, to if I was that person that's only basing everything off of talent, I didn't worry about three and four and all of that because I'm, right. I'm the best. Like, I'm good. I'm good. Right. And some days, you're just not as good as you would like to be. And that's where I think the most prepared person with what is your pregame, whether you're a doctor, whether you're a, a, a policeman, always probably about 80 to 90 percent of the time before you step out of wherever you're going to do it you have a plan because if you don't if you plan if you fail to plan you plan to fail and that's how i see that so you aren't only targeting athletes for example you're targeting everybody right well yes because ultimately i want to try to 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 show the similarities of how people who are successful have a successful recipe for success. Whether, like I said, that's a mental thing. How, how do you deal with stress? Where do you go? Um, um, what do you eat? Is it a nutritional thing? Is it nutritional values that sets you aside from the other guy who you beat all the time? Is it that you're able to outlast them because you eat broccoli and and turnips and hog mogs and pig feet or is it that you eat you know steak and eggs so who knows uh, i I, re I remembered like jackie bradley jackie bradley eats a lot of cereal this kid can fly and it can throw a baseball 300 miles so, so just maybe the secret right <laughs> you there. know what i mean who knows what the secret is but right. the thing is we know that Everyone has some type of secret uh, recipe for success. You know, the best moments you can have on, on a people to people level is sharing a meal. And you get to do that on the show. Why was that important for you to display? Why was it important for you to let viewership into such an intim intimate moment like that where you're sharing, you're putting stuff out on the table over a meal with someone like a Jackie Bradley Jr.? Well, I, I think that a lot of times we do not get to see the real person. A lot of times uh, when you're in a, a place where you play or you work, uh, people are not looking for the best things. They're looking for the worst things that will come out of your situation. Because if they're able to talk about it, people don't want to hear sometimes when you're doing the best. But they, they don't mind opening their ears up when they know things are not going right. So for me, when you share your meal with someone, that's when you're at ease. You're relaxing. You know, you, you're not thinking about stats. You're not thinking about why I didn't do this or do that. You're thinking about a nice meal. You're thinking about uh, maybe a, 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 an adult beverage. Uh, you're, you're putting your mind and your fence and your guards down because you're saying, hey, I, I'm relaxing. And if I'm here having dinner with this person, whatever questions he's asking, he knows that and that's what I feel and I give myself credit for is 
I know where to go. I'm not trying to go anywhere where I'm a tricky, you know. And I think that the guys who are coming on my show, they they can feel that Sam Horn is not a threat to them, and they can feel like they can relax with me over dinner or over a, a glass of uh, champagne or wine or whatever. We can kick back. We can hang out on a boat. We can hang out at the bowling alley. We can do whatever you do. We can even go to the to the basketball court, if you've seen the last show, with Walter. I'm, you know, I'm not going there again with him, but either way, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is the kind of chance. stuff, you know, him yeah. and I, we had lunch first, and he just happened to have a couple extra minutes, so we popped over to a gym to shoot a few. And, and that's kind of like what we're looking to do is just keep it real but at the same time, keep it real simple and keep it where you can be real comfortable. How can people follow the show? Well, we're on whatisyourpregame.com, and we're also on CSN in Boston, which is CSN Northeast. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, we appreciate uh, all, all of the opportunities that we've gotten so far through them, and we, uh, we look forward to any other outlets that might be out there for us. But at the same time, we're very happy now and hopefully you will keep up with us on CSN. Absolutely. And the best part about it is if you miss a show on Comcast Sportsnet on one of those Saturday mornings, you guys put the full episodes up onto YouTube shortly after. 48 hours afterwards, we're on there. That's that's the commitment that we have. So we try to give it about 72 hours and then we're up so there's no static. And uh, we hope that by you having a chance to see it, we'll just uh, maybe secure your interest in wanting to see the show more for sure and the email to get in touch with the show and more specifically for Allie for you to claim this Sam Horn signed Major League Baseball email info at what is your pregame.com that's info at what is your pregame.com so Ali claim your baseball I'm tossing it to Sam right now to sign I could do that and uh he'll he'll make that out to you but uh other than that that is the inaugural episode of the Sam Horn Live podcast. Sam, is there anything else you want to put on the table? Well, no, I just want to say thanks thanks to all of the listeners out there. Uh, we invite you to check out what is your pregame. Uh, we will be doing some things in the community. Uh, we're looking uh, uh, for a home with a charity. So if you have a favorite charity that you might want us to take a look at, we're on. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that is the Sam Horn Live podcast. I'm Luis Vasquez. You already know, joined by entrepreneur, family man, <laughs> <laughs> TV personality. The list goes on. Sam Horn. Sam, hopefully we get to episode two. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, we're working. At this is a hey, I always tell people you can't get to two until you do number one. <laughs> and here it is. Thanks for checking it out. Until later. Hasta luego. We out. Peace.